So I came across this uh, rather interesting forum post uh, about the automated quantification of mycelium area on a Petri dish. So I figured I might make a video on this given how niche and specialized it is because you know you don't really come across these kinds of posts on a uh, forum geared for digital pathology, typically of whole slide images. <clears throat> so uh, just a quick summary, a colleague of mine interested in quantifying the area of mycelium growth on a petri dish. Uh, I haven't taken uh, any fungi courses in my undergrad in quite some time, but my understanding is this kind of brownish area over here is mycelium, and these individual hairs are called hyphae. Hy hyphae? Yeah, something like hyphae. Um, or sorry, I, I think they actually explained the mycelium is in the center, it's a dark brown thing. And by day six, the threads are growing, or have grown out quite a bit. So day zero, day three, and day six. And my understanding is that they want to essentially quantify this sort of expanding slash spreading nature. Um, you know, like to quantify the area of the mycelium coverage. So at the central brown structure including the threads over time image each day. So theoretically, we could create a pixel classifier that combines uh, area measurements of both the central mycelium mass and these threads, which for all intents and purposes, I'll call hyphae, even though it might not necessarily be correct. Uh, we like to image daily. We were unable to stain the mycelium. So yeah, that that was probably my first recommendation was to stain for a dye that has an affinity for chitin because it's a key component of um, fungal cell walls. Um, that's going to be kind of tricky, but we'll see. So they've tried simple thresholding, but since we're exposing mycelium to oil, also dark brown, we didn't have much success. Right off the bat, I might recommend something along the lines of deconvolution to potentially separate the oily like color from mycelium but again like if you've looked at any kind of fungus in general typically they lack any kind of pigmentation so as a result the mycelium the hyphae um, any chitinous structure will be white unless colored otherwise and if you have oil well both your background and your mycelium will be taking up this oil and consequently stain for the same or be positive for the same color vector, just at different, um, I guess you could say, luminum, luminance values. So uh, anyone has any suggestions on how we could automate the quantification? So keyword here is automate. Uh, that's going to be the tricky challenge. So in the first part of the video, I'll show some of the more manual tools you can use to quantify area measurements. And then I'll give my best shot at automated quantification. Uh, I believe someone over here commented using pixel classifier using texture features. So yeah, that's probably the best bet. I mean, if you do enough feature augmentation, you should be able to get a reasonable pixel classifier. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, there's a good demonstration over here. Uh, yeah, let's uh, give it a shot. So I've already loaded a project with the three images as downloaded from the forum thread. Now, because we're going to be discussing area and most likely you want to um, export area measurements in something along the lines of microns or millimeters squared, the first thing we'll need to do is basically set the resolution. Now, when you put a picture on a forum, I believe it strips the resolution metadata, either that or wasn't originally provided. So you can see pixel width and pixel height are currently unknown. Now, anytime we draw a annotation like uh, this, for example, it'll report the area in pixel squared. But I would rather just for convenience purposes or ease of explanation. Well, let me just reset it to default classes. Um, use some kind of 
uh, metric area based measurement and for that we have to specify resolution metadata which we currently don't really have <laughs> so if you kind of look at this sample you can make out the letters p y r e and x this also appears to be glass and most likely borosilicate glass um, so if we just search pyrex borosilicate glass we can look across this amazon listing now i believe uh these glass petri dishes can come in a variety of sizes, most commonly 60 millimeters, uh, 100 millimeters, and 150 millimeters in diameter. I'm going to guess and say this is 100 millimeters in diameter, but to the person who actually made this forum post, uh, you can update the image metadata with what the actual resolution is. Either if you know some kind of constant measurement, like the actual real world um, diameter of your petri dish or the resolution of your camera um, you can update that accordingly so let's actually get started and do a very 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 loose estimate as to what the resolution might be uh, we draw a line simulating the diameter and then we go to the uh, image tab double click on any of these enter selected line length we are going to say it's 100 millimeters in diameter. Um, and if we do 100 to micrometers, that's whatever this value is. Um, so now this line should be, well, 100 millimeters. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we can go back to the image tab and see that the resolution is about 58 microns per pixel. Um, and I will actually delete this line since we no longer need it. And copy the pixel width and pixel height values and apply it to the rest of the images. There's probably a more automated way of um, doing this, but... Again, for the sake of a quick demonstration, I'm not going to spend too much time trying to find a relevant script for this. So now that we have specified the resolution metadata, let's do the simplest form of quantification, which is manual annotations. Now, I know the forum post explicitly stated that we were looking for an automated quantification, but I want to start simple and then work our way out to more complicated um, methods. So the first thing you can do is simply create a circle. We can draw a circle around our mycelium and ta-da, we have area. This is the area in square micrometers. If you want to convert that to square millimeters, just divide by a thousand squared, which is like a million. Um, now we can go ahead and repeat this for all of the other, actually I'll call this um, mycelium. and set that class. Now we will repeat the same, but we'll also need to have a new class for hyphae, or the hair-like filaments that come out of the mycelium. Again, I'm not a fungi biologist, so this might not be hyphae, but it's the only thing I remember from my undergrad days about fungus is fungi. Um, so drawing a circle here and drawing a larger circle loosely around where the hyphae kind of ends. You see, like we don't have very good contrast between the oily background and the oil staining hyphae. So of course that's going to be a problem. Um, yeah, and then the circle will be uh, mycelium. Now we're going to need to subtract the two from one another just to get hyphae by itself. Of course, we can actually just subtract the measurements in the CSV file itself, but I'm curious to see if there's a convenient way of doing this. Um, let's see. That didn't work. Um, I 
No, still didn't work. Finally. <laughs> so, uh, I was just having a little bit of trouble trying to figure out what the order is of classes required for subtraction. And I believe the subtractor, so the mycelium in the center, has to be the first selected object. And then the second select selected object is what you are subtracting the subtractor from, which in this case was uh, a circle around both the mycelium and the uh, uh, hyphae. So now we have a new annotation that solely corresponds to hyphae. Uh, so if you want to get, you know, hyphae area, this technically is one way to go about this. And just to actually show you what is being selected, we can do Shift F. Probably should change the annotation color to something like yellow or green. So it's actually this area that's being selected. And of course, we can repeat this for all of the other days. Um, so yeah, this is essentially the simplest form of quantification. And we can export these measurements just as we would any other measurements, uh, any other annotation me level measurements from QPath. But of course, the forum post explicitly stated that they were looking for automated methods. So on that note, let's actually get started. First things first color vectors. So when I've loaded in these uh, images, I've labeled it as uh, bright field other. By default, however, I believe it loads in color vectors pertaining to hematoxylin and dab. Yeah, neither of which we actually have in the image. So if we turn on the hematoxylin channel, well, it just seems to be um, staining for the edge of the glass slide and to a lesser extent you know some of the mycelium and a bit of the hyphae but you know we're gonna have to change these color vectors um, the reason i feel it's important to at least specify some form of color vectors that are specific for this image is uh, when we're training the pixel classifier we're gonna need features and the more features we have typically the higher accuracy you get with pixel classifiers one method of data augmentation for generating these features can be deconvolution. So even though it doesn't really generate any new data per se, by incorporating uh, color vector information into the pixel classifier in the form of deconvoluted channels, potentially that can improve the accuracy. So how do we perform or how do we go about uh, deconvolution? Oh, sorry, setting the color vectors. Um, we can draw, you know, because this image isn't too large. Uh, yeah, we can draw a annotation around more or less the whole image. We just want to make sure that the majority of pixels lies in the background, so that can make its way into the residual class. And go to actually, let me turn on uh, input display so you can see what buttons I'm pressing. Uh, and then you want to go to analyze preprocessing and estimate stain vectors. So it says modal values uh, do not do not match current background values. Are these modal values coming from the background or from the brown oil? Well, let's take a look. 203, 216, 226. We hover around here, we see 201, 212, 216. We hover around here, it's in the hundreds range. So it's safe to say that um, if we are estimating stain vectors, it is correctly estimating the modal, uh, using the modal values as background. So we'll click uh, yes. Now, well, we'll just click auto. And if we click okay, now we can well, get rid of this annotation and observe our quote-unquote hematoxylin, which we probably should rename. Okay, I guess I cannot rename this. Um, which, surprisingly, does a pretty good job of separating the hyphae and the mycelium from the background. If we look at DAB, DAB to me looks like it's picking up more of the oil. Um, if we go back and forth between the original and actually adjust the display settings, just to better visualize um, 
the oil. Maybe even make it a little darker. Um, yeah, so I would say for the most part, Dab is picking up oil and yeah. And then hematoxylin is uh, mycelium. Again, we can adjust this and give it a little bit more contrast. So now I'm actually really impressed with how this turned out. Um, there's much more contrast between the hyphae and the mycelium compared to the original image. Um, so let me just reduce the saturation. So let's go ahead and uh, apply these color vectors to all images in the project. So we can go to workflow, create script, um yeah so there actually is a programmatic way of setting a pixel size um and all we want to do is really just set the color deconvol uh, color deconvolution stains so we apply it to all images and just take a quick look so to me i have a feeling this might be a bit easier to quantify like it's almost night and day the contrast that you can see um, well, not night and day per se. I mean, it would be much better if we had some kind of counter stain, but eh, we work with what we've got. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, as Research Associate mentioned, your best bet is probably using Pixel Classifier with some texture related features. So, let's figure out what classes we want. Well, we're going to need uh, ignore, which will relate to the background. Uh, possibly a class relating to the edge of the glass slide. Oh, look, GeForce Game Ready Driver is available. On a side note, if you're working with a um, GPU accelerated Stardust, uh, it's important to uh, keep your drivers up to date uh, for NVIDIA graphics cards, because <laughs> it wouldn't work for me otherwise. Anyways, uh, let's put some examples of the ignore class. Um, probably make a new class called uh, glass. And that'll just be... Mm, this stuff over here. I don't think we need a lot of examples. Um, I'll make a new class called oil. And we'll just kind of brush all around this area. And we have our hyphae class if I'm pronouncing it right, which I have no idea if I am. And our mycelium class. Oops. So, I mean, one of the reasons I like using the brush tool is because it kind of snaps onto uh, edges of high contrast, which we don't really seem to have, well, in terms of well-defined edges. So we'll see how things turn out. Again, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, annotating all of these projects um, just because I want something quick and robust as a for demonstration purposes. Um, yeah, so let's just quickly repeat this on a few other images. Uh, background, glass, oil. Um, I might actually want to uh, delete a bit of that. And hi, Faye. So actually, here's a 
bit of a question for the OP or the original poster. Where do you define the end of the hyphae? Is it where there is kind of like no longer a oil, no oil boundary, so somewhere along here, or is it to the edge of um, where you can very faintly see these small filaments? Also, I'm not a fan of JPEG 2000 compression, or sorry, any JPEG compression, uh, as you can see why. Um, but again, we're not aiming for perfection. We're just trying to do a quick demonstration of how someone could implement a pixel classifier to quantify this stuff. And finally, we go back into our mycelium core. All right, so I'll also, you know, annotate this image as well. Um, ignore mycelium. We will not actually have a hyphae class for this image because there is no hyphae present. Um, so when I'm previewing the pixel classifier, I probably won't load this image because it might break some stuff uh, since it's missing a class. Um, but I will use the annotation, I'll import or load the annotations from this image into a different image, most likely the day six case because it has good representation of all of our classes of interest. Um, oh, and yeah, some uh, glass as well. All right. So to trade a pixel classifier, I mean, the actual action is fairly straightforward. You do a pixel classifier, train pixel classifier, but there are numerous hyperparameters that just make it quite a hassle to actually deal with. Um, right off the bat, I recommend using the full image resolution. These are fairly small images measuring 1920 by 2560 pixels, so no harm in using full image resolution. In fact, we can actually go above uh, full image resolution and enter a resolution uh, value smaller than the image's resolution. And what will happen is it essentially upscales your image, does a prediction, uh, does the class pixel classification, and then shrinks it back down to its original size. Much more computationally intensive, but it might improve pixel classifier accuracy at um, detecting really small structures, perhaps these dots. But I wouldn't imagine that's something you'd necessarily want classified. In fact, uh, near after we've done the full resolution classification, I have a feeling it'll actually run better if we operate at lower resolutions because the structures we're trying to delineate um, are in fact large macroscopic, well, by definition, uh, regions. <clears throat> so artificial neural network, full image resolution uh, features. So this is where uh, deconvolution comes into play. We can now use the hematoxylin dab, eh, not so much residual, uh, channels to improve pixel classifier accuracy. And of course, add a bunch of different scales I like to add the first four features, but uh, these ones over here typically relate to texture-ish related features, so we might end up using those. Local normalization, you can leave it off for now because I don't see too much variation in lighting conditions across these uh, cases. Um, and of course, we need load training from all of the other images. So on that note, we can click Live Prediction. Uh, is it working? I believe so. Taking longer than expected. Not quite sure what's going on here. Um, Okay, so uh, we've got quite a few classes, hyphae, ignore mycelium, oil, and glass. Down the line, we can merge some of the classes that we don't really care about together um, or just delete them entirely. But yeah, it's, uh, 
Hmm. I probably should have. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. So it's insisting this glass class is actually mycelium. Uh, in any sense, uh, you can create, you know, manual annotations just are in the circle around the petri dish that you want to analyze. If you want to omit any kind of misclassifications that can result from uh, the pixel classifier mistaking the glass for an actual mycelia or typhae. But if we just focus on the central mass, we can see it does a reasonably good job at identifying oil, but in the hyphae, it's not a super clean edge. Mycelium seems to be fine. Or actually, no, it's insisting that it is hyphae. Um, perhaps if we swap our classifier to something like random trees, it might do a better job. Personally, I found random trees tends to work better for artificial neural net uh, compared to artificial neural networks despite artificial neural networks generally having a higher uh, accuracy on the training set. So we'll give random trees a shot and see what we get. Uh, we might also want to bump down the resolution to something lower because all of these tiny little dots we don't really care about and it'll just interfere with um, the classification. So yeah. Kind of surprised it's taking this long. Um, for whatever reason, training the pixel classifier seems to be stuck on just a single logical processor of a CPU, but it is what it is. So yeah, now it's doing a much, much better job here. It correctly identified the glass. Uh, it's missing a little bit of glass, just calling this ignore, but in either sense, glass and ignore can be interchangeable because we want to exclude these from analysis. Uh, segmented the oil, uh, segmented the hyphae, segmented the mycelium, but we do still see a bit of aberrant misclassifications um, kind of in the central mass. Um, yeah. Now, what if we lowered resolution to something like uh, by a factor of four? This should improve uh, the speed, at the very least, of the pixel classifier. Although I can't quite figure out why it's taking so long, but hmm. yeah, it is what it is. I'm also using uh, a build of QPath that was built a few days prior to 0.4.0's official release. So you might actually have uh, better performing pixel classifiers in the official release. Anyways, uh, yeah, much better job. Um, again, because we don't really care about these small details. In fact, why don't we just go lower? Um, yeah, I mean, as you can see, it's much faster. Uh, less prone to these sorts of small pixel misclassifications. Um, now, because we have a bit of computational overhead, we could potentially uh, add a downsample, uh, or sorry, a, a upscaling scale. So what it'll basically do here is it'll upscale the image by a factor of two, uh, do the pixel and augment um, the training with features uh, of these this new scale. So basically, the total number of features is going to be the product of the number of channels, number of scales, and number of features. So we should have a total of five by five by four, which is a hundred features. And if we actually go to um, let's see. Show classification? No. There used to be a way of um, ah show, perhaps. There we go. So 
Yep, 100 features in total, and we can actually just kind of scroll through all the different features that are present. And in some way, shape, or form, these are informative in uh, classifying our pixel values. If we look at our classifier accuracy, well, it's unfortunately at 100%, which sounds good, but it just means that we need more training annotations to truly improve the accuracy of the classifier because, well, we've already optimized as best as we can. If we start adding more features, well, we can only realistically go down from here because we can't go above 100%. So I'll try and add these uh, remaining features, again, because we have the computational overhead, but I don't expect to get noticeably different results yet. Yeah, it's more or less the same. If we take a look at the pixel classifier, uh, the features went up from 100 to about 250, but that means nothing because the uh, accuracy in the training set in both cases was 100%. So yeah, I would say this is reasonable. Um, and because we've already specified um, the resolution metadata, albeit it might be incorrect, um, we now can report things like mycelium area in square microns or hyphae area in square microns. And we can essentially compare the change and increase in hyphae area as a function of time. So day zero, day three, and day six. Let's go ahead and open another image. Again, we're just trying to preview the uh, results of the pixel classifier here. Don't know if uh, accuracy will update. Yeah, it's still at the same, 100%. Um, so we do have a bit of a, an aberrant misclassification over here. I'm curious to see if we... Well, the simple solution would be just to annotate this um, as uh, um, oil and see if that improves pixel classifier accuracy. I believe right now it is annotated as nothing. Well, it doesn't have any annotation. So yeah, simple solution, re-annotate this as oil should improve pixel classifier accuracy. The complicated uh, solution is to uncheck all of these features that I don't commonly use, uh, retrain the model, and see if this now gets yeah classified as oil. I don't know if, what, for whatever reason, but uh, I've never had success using these eight out of 12 features or uh, feature augmentations. Normally with machine learning, it should optimize um, based on the features that are most important for the model's performance. In fact, with random trees, you can actually export variable importance and it'll tell you that. Um, in fact, why don't we go ahead and do that? And I'll show you why I think those features just end up confusing the model. So <clears throat> with random trees, we can calculate the variable importance. Uh, believe it's retraining it now. So once we have retrained it, well, the accuracy should remain the same at 100%. Huh, I've never seen that before. Um, and now we have an explanation of what features play the most important role. So Gaussian. Gaussian blurs are arguably just the most commonly uh, most important feature that I've seen in most pixel classifiers. Uh, we see, well, we actually see a bit of the features that I was saying I've never really seen be important before, like Hestian max eigenvalue, um, which I'm guessing is derived from some eigenvector or structure tensor coherence. But yeah, I would say just don't use these features for now. <laughs> I mean, you know, play around with the pixel classifier, see what you get. The whole point of this is both optimizing pixel classifier hyperparameters, but also spending some of that time in simply just generating new annotations. Uh, if anything, 
annotations are or an abundance of uh and equal weighting of annotations is just as if not more in some cases important as the hyperparameters you set for the pixel classifier whether it be the choice of classifier resolution features um, or advanced options which i'm not going to touch for the sake of this video and yeah so assuming we're satisfied with our uh, pixel classifier we'll give it a name call it um i don't know fungus among us uh, v1 and we can create objects full image um, minimum object size so if you want to remove if you want to perform some filtering and remove these small fragments you can set a minimum object size I'll leave it blank for now but you can adjust this as you see fit. Uh, we don't need to split objects because I don't think we have multiple mycelia or multiple hyphae areas per petri dish. We can delete existing objects because we don't want to start mixing. Uh, when we export our annotation measurements, we don't want to mix the ones that we use for training with the ones generated from the pixel classifier. Um, Create objects for ignored classes. No, because we don't care about those. Um, yeah. And now we can basically create a script uh, and run it for the rest of the images in the project. All right. And, you know, I'll fill in the annotations. Oh, they're already filled in uh, to see what we have. So aside from a few small misclassifications, which honestly I wouldn't worry too much about, um, it seems to be doing a fairly decent job. So now let's go ahead and export these uh, measurements. These will be annotation level measurements. I like working with CSV, so I'll choose that and we'll just save it. Now let's take a look at, um, I'll try and visualize some of these measurements. I will quickly make a pivot chart wherever I go to make that. Uh, pivot chart, pivot table. And this is kind of like a very user-friendly way of quickly plotting uh, some simple charts. So image class um, and area. Those are probably the measurements we'd want. Now let's see if we can filter on class. Ah, let me put that here. And as for class, we do not care about glass. We do not care about oil. Mycelium and hyphae are the only ones we want quantified. Um, and here we're reporting the sum of all area measurements. So keep in mind, if we look at the... I want to get rid of this. It's just lingering around. Um, hmm, didn't know you could do that. Uh, if we go back to our measurements, we can see that we'll have multiple annotation measurements from each. Or sorry, no, we will only have one measurement per class per image. Um, so yeah, some should be fine. Now, you can look at area measurements by themselves. Uh, by themselves, the problem here is, well. 
I don't know if this is the same mycelium just measured across multiple days or a different piece of seed mycelium in different petri dishes, uh, which were imaged at different days. The reason I think this might be an issue is if we look at absolute area values, we have nothing to normalize to if the mycelium changes in initial size across each of these different images. It doesn't seem to be all that much, um, but one thing we can do is we can actually um, do something along the lines of percent hyphae. So we can sum, uh, we can take hyphae, if you pronounce it, and divide by the sum of the annotations that we're interested in quantifying, so hyphae plus mycelium. Um, that will make things a bit more complicated, but it's up to you in terms of how you want to visualize it. In any sense, what we can see from this chart is that in day zero, we have a small bit of mycelium. That's about it. On day three, we have that same small bit of mycelium, perhaps it's slightly larger, who am I to say? Um, but, well, maybe a statistician could answer that if you have multiple samples. And now we see the emergence of our hyphae class, which is fairly small. In day six, we now see that hyphae's area greatly exceeds that of mycelium. Um, yeah, so, Hopefully this video was in some way, shape or form, you know, useful uh, in terms of answering your question. But I think Research Associated hit the nail on the head when he recommended using a pixel classifier. When in doubt, just throw machine learning at a problem until it fixes it or you end up having two problems, one of which is your machine learning algorithm. And <laughs> um, yeah, so this isn't in essence what Research Associated um, mentioned and demonstrated here. Um, and as I mentioned, you can perform size, size exclusion to remove any small fragments that are misclassified. Um, yeah. So on that note, I will end the recording, post the video on the forums, uh, well, as a response to your uh, thread. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to let me know. And on that note, uh, thanks and enjoy, well, the holidays. <laughs>